Welcome back, pet parents. I'm really excited for today's episode because we have Dr. Katie Woodley back with us. Yay! But more, more importantly, because these episodes are obviously for you, uh, when I talked to Dr. Katie Woodley in the past, we talked about how pet parents re really need practical advice. And so that's what she has agreed to come on and talk to us about today. So if you're not familiar with Dr. Katie Woodley, she is a holistic veterinarian and she is the visionary behind The Natural Pet Doctor, which by the way, is an incredible source of information online. I highly recommend you check out her social medias and her website. And she's very much devoted in weaving Eastern traditions into Western medical practices, which I think is just fabulous. We really need to, instead of looking at one or the other, combine them and, and utilize them in ways where we are figuring out like what are their strengths and, and making them kind of work together. So we're going to be talking today about some really practical advice for you, for your pets, for at-home care. And if you are new to the podcast, my name is Jessica Fisher. This is the Pet Parenting Reset. I'm a certified canine nutritionist and holistic pet health coach and a positive reinforcement dog trainer. And I'm going to stop the list there because there's just too much. But on this podcast, we talk about all things proactive health for you to become the best pet parent you can be to your dogs and cats. So Thank you so much for agreeing to come back on, Dr. Katie. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And thanks so much for having me back. I truly appreciate it. And Jessica, I love all that you are doing to help pet parents and help their pets. <laughs> it's just amazing, all the things that you do. So thank you so much for doing what you're, what you're doing in the world. You're so sweet. Thank you so much. Um, because it, it takes a village. It, it does. does. It to... does take a village. <laughs> Not every day is easy. And so many pet parents experience that too. And it's the same on this side also. So the more we have support and help one another, this is where we were just talking about the movement, right? This is how the movement picks up speed, but also too gives us strength to keep on going, which is really important for all of us involved in this. Absolutely. Um, there's just so much more that, first of all, we don't know what we don't know. There's so much to learn still. And that's kind of what I think for a lot of people in the healthy pet space, especially um, veterinarians like yourself, kind of keeps you pushing the limits with where, how can we look at this differently and where can we take this? Because it really is not a very scientific mindset to just say, this is how it is and this is how it's always going to be. But more like, we don't know what we don't know. There are so many possibilities. Let's test our theories and see what actually happens. Um, but you are, uh, you have really leaned into gut health for our pets and not without good cause it is we as we talked about the last time you were on the show like 70 percent of the immune system lives in the gut so we can't ignore it it isn't the only thing we need to be looking at but it is a huge factor in what we need to be looking at and so many of the i i don't I think it was like nationwide pet insurance. I was looking at their st statistics of what pets are going into the veterinarian's office for, and so many of those like top ten things are gut issues. Mm -hmm. And even if pet parents don't realize their gut issues, they actually are gut issues. So talking about like some really practical things that pet parents can do at home they never think about it until there's actually a problem. So like, well, we have some problems and I want to know what you would have pet parents do at home. And then like, when do we need to make that call and say, you know what, pack up, let's go to the bed. Yes. Yes. That can be the hardest part, right? Like we all want to like mm -hmm. avoid going to the vet, but I've talked to some pet parents where it's like, you really do actually need to go like it's more serious and life threatening if you stay at home. So this is where, you know, you mentioned the the eastern, the western and yes, we don't want to use drugs inappropriately which they're commonly overprescribed and there's a lot of great other 
options, which we're going to be covering today, which I'm so excited about. But there is a place for Western medicine, and especially with acute care, um, it can save lives and it can really help you get through some of these crises that can occur. Um, I always say to, I probably said it last time or, you know, the last time I was on, um, if I ever get hit by a car, please take me to the ER, right? Give me some pain meds. If I need surgery, please like fix my broken femur. Um, and then that's when like afterwards, acupuncture, rehab, all the like herbs, supplements, things like that will help me long term. But this is where Western medicine thrives in acute care. It does not thrive when we have chronic health issues. But the good thing is, is that when we talk about a lot of these common health conditions that arise from, as you mentioned, Jessica, like the gut, so ear problems, diarrhea, itchiness, hot spots, a lot of these things we can help manage at home very well with certain types of herbs and other supplements and foods. And I use a lot of teas, but here's the thing. They're called an emergency for a reason because we never know when it's going to happen. But I can almost guarantee like 99% of the time it will happen overnight on the weekends and on a holiday because it happens to vets too during that time, right? And it's this is where it's really important to have these things on hand. I recommend using like getting an ER kit put together, having it set aside for yourself, for your pets. That way you can just go straight to it. You don't have the stress also if it's like, you know, midnight and you're like, well, no stores are open. I can't go and get these things. You already have it ready and it helps eliminate a lot of the stress that occurs when these emergencies or these acute care situations happen. So that's really, really important um, to be prepared and ready for those types of things. Tico's <laughs> joining us as he usually does. It's so welcome. This <laughs> is a pet podcast. Um, okay. So let's start with diarrhea. Mm. That is like, so many people are like, as soon as their dog has a bout of diarrhea, they're like, ah, I'm calling the vet. But yeah, I don't. We don't always need to do that right away. So what? Yeah. What are What do you tell people when their dog has diarrhea? First, think about yourself, right? So when we have diarrhea ourselves, do we always go to the urgent care? No, most of the time we don't, right? So following a lot of similar principles that we use for our own selves when we have diarrhea is really essential for both our dogs and cats. Now, there are certain situations where I do recommend going for diarrhea. Um, this is where if you have, you're seeing a lot of blood coming out of the rectal area, like blood is pouring out. We do, that can be hemorrhagic gastroenteritis that can cause electrolyte issues. They can get really dehydrated very quickly. Um, and that's, that's an emergency. I do recommend going in if you're seeing that. Now, if your pet is still like bright, alert, they're still like running around, they want to eat, but there's you know, squirting out the back end, then this is where using supplements and herbs and, you know, fasting, bland diets, broth, things like that can be very, very helpful. So, but I always say, if you're concerned, go to the vet. Um, really, really mm -hmm. important. And I think there's a lot of guilt with a lot of pet parents when they go. And if there's medications or drugs that are given, like we feel like guilt and shame, like your pet, you're taking care of your pet. So it's okay if you do go in and get support and help. But hopefully some of these tips will help. So you may not need to go in. So if your pet's still bright, alert, um, if they're really lethargic and laying around and they don't want to, like they're not responding, they're separating themselves from you, they're having repeat bouts of diarrhea and it's not letting up and it's potentially getting worse too. Those are instances that definitely please go to the vet. So Let's talk about some of the things to have on hand because there's some really awesome herbs and supplements that are very easy to get for anyone anywhere in the world. So I imagine we have some people listening, not just in the US. So I'm a big fan of using a lot of human products also because they can be sometimes easier to find. They can also be lower in cost too for pet parents, which is nice, and they work the same. Um, if you are using human products, please make sure you read the ingredient list looking for things like xylitol. Um, so sugars, artificial ingredients, flavorings, things like that. But xylitol is toxic and can actually kill pets. Um, it's very serious. So make sure you read the ingredient list if you are using something like that. But first, what I would do is this is where a bland diet is very helpful. So think about yourself. Do you, are you going to be eating a steak? Like for dinner, if you have diarrhea, 
probably not right. <laughs> like you don't feel good. You're like, that's going to make more and we don't want that. <laughs> so this is where a lot of times I'm talking about like having some like white fish or cod, some canned pumpkin on hand. That's a really good bland diet. I'm not as big of a fan of rice because it can aggravate a lot of pets, especially if they're on raw food diets. But if that's all you have on hand, it's better than nothing. Small amounts. Um, so less food. Remember, we don't want to, we want to rest the gut and calm things down and adding in things like bone broth can be very beneficial for helping with the nutrients and calming things down and soothing the gut. That's all irritated when we have the symptoms of diarrhea. So keep in mind, diet is a big part of this. We don't want to keep feeding them the same food. Um, the other things too, what's really powerful and helpful are herbs like slippery elm or marshmallow root. So those are what we call mucilages. So if you ever like get slippery, if you have slippery elm and you make a, like a mixture or concoction with it, um, if you feel it, it's very slippery. Um, obviously it's called slippery elm marshmallow roots the same but it's it's thicker and it's slippery because what it's doing in the body is it's actually coating the entire gi tract and calming down inflammation so it's like a band-aid um, for the gut so this can work for vomiting diarrhea acid reflux it's very powerful so either work very similar marshmallow root can be a little bit stronger um, but those that's very, very helpful. So I always say start with that. You can mix it in some broth. And then the other thing that I tend to add in right away is a beneficial yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii. So what this does is that it helps modulate the immune system, it helps calm down inflammation, and it can resolve diarrhea really quickly. So it's very powerful, and you can just open up a capsule, mix it in with the broth, and either syringe it or have your pet just lick up that slippery elm, uh, Saccharomyces boulardii mixture, and then rest and watch. Give them time for it to work. We don't want to feed them right away. Rest that gut. Um, and see how they do. That might be all that's needed. So those are definitely two things to have on hand, slippery elm or marshmallow root. You could have both. Your Saccharomyces boulardii, have some bone broth that you can have on hand that you can make up pretty quickly. There's a lot of great companies out there that make it easy to do that. Um, and if we need extra help, so this is where we have to think about, well, what's actually happening with diarrhea? The body's trying to get things out. So there's a lot of inflammation. There can be like the bacteria, the microbiome can be producing upset. It's upset, it's producing toxins. And so this is where I do recommend using binders. These are very powerful at binding to those toxins, helping with the inflammation and getting it out. So instead of it sitting there or getting recirculated and stored in the body, this is why activated charcoal is really powerful as like a detox supplement. So activated charcoal, very easy to find. It's very cheap. Uh, you can use it for both your dogs and cats. Um, it can be constipating. That's the point, right? When we have diarrhea. And it will also turn the stool black. That is normal. So if you see black stool, it doesn't mean that they're like digesting blood or there's blood. And a lot of pet parents freak out when they don't know that, of course. But this is a completely normal finding if you give activated charcoal. So giving activated charcoal, you don't need a ton. Start with a, just a tiny, like an eighth of a teaspoon and see how they do. Give it with lots of water, offer that, um, and see how they do. Once again, that might be all that's needed. So if that's the only thing you can access, have some activated charcoal on hand. Now, there are a lot of like pet brands out there that have different types of binders like RX Clay from RX Vitamins. Also, Bentonite Clay is another type of binder. The binders have different types of affinities, meaning that they'll bind to different types of toxins. Sometimes they can bind to food and things like that. I don't care when you give this at this point. So for acute diarrhea, it doesn't matter if like it's binding to the food, if that's the only way you can get it into your pet. I don't care. It's okay. If it unbalances things for the short term. Um, if you're using something like that for the long term, then of course we want to give it at least two hours away from the food, from supplements, from other medications, if your pet's on medications. Um, but binders are really powerful and helpful. And I find they're getting, they're getting more, there's more awareness around them now, but they're mm -hmm. still not commonly used. 
Um, and I use them all the time with my clients, but I recommend having some on hand. So whatever you can access. Um, so those are a couple ways to help support when we're experiencing acute diarrhea. And all of those can also be given to cats too. Um, I do want to shout out a product with cats because cats are unique, right? We were just talking about our kitties and how yeah. getting things into cats isn't always the easiest. And sometimes it can be detrimental to your hands, right? So, um, and we don't want to create more stress when there's diarrhea or illness or sickness. And so there is a product by Animal Essentials Colon Rescue. If you can access, like get that product, it has, it's in a glycerin tincture. And so it's, it tastes doesn't taste bad. It's very well tolerated and it has slippery elm, marshmallow root. It has plantain, which is an astringent. Mm. So it helps dry up things. That's what we want. We want to dry up inflammation. And then it also has licorice in it too. So licorice is a nice tonic for the body. It has anti-inflammatory properties. It's very soothing and calming. Um, so it's a it's a nice all around option that's pretty easy to get into cats, whether it's in a little bit of food or you can syringe it if your cat doesn't get too stressed with that. Um, so that's where it's it's nice if we can use tinctures like that. And also, too, the way I use it for my kitties, if I need to in those situations, is you can mix in things with that glycerin tincture and then syringe it all together. So that's where adding in a little bit of Saccharomyces boulardii and then adding in a little bit of a binder. And then it's just like doop, done, right? So one shot yeah. in the mouth and then we're done. And a lot of times one dose for a lot of pets and cats especially will help clear that up when this acute diarrhea happens. Mm, that's good to know. And I so that I have two questions. The first is I know a lot of pet parents freak out over the word yeast. Yes. And yes. So especially when we talk about ears and hot spots and itchiness, right? Right. So when you say Saccharomyces boulardii is a then beneficial it's yeast. It's a good one. This is yes, this is not something that if you have a dog that is struggling with yeast that you're going to, it's not like throwing fuel on the fire, right? Yeah, that's, so that's actually a really important because a lot of times we see, or I do anyways, in daily life experience, animals that have skin issues and gut health, like diarrhea issues, they come hand in hand because of the, the gut skin access. So this is where your Saccharomyces boulardii, when we think about, so thinking about the microbiome, so the microbiome is made up of trillions of different types of microorganisms. There's going to be bacteria, there's going to be yeast. So there's going to be protozoa, uh, there's going to be fungi, there's going to be all sorts of different organisms that make up that ecosystem. So mm -hmm. this is where we tend to start attacking certain strains like candida. Um, when we have an overgrowth of candida yeast, that's a type of yeast, candida albicans, then that's where we get worried. Okay, we get ear infections. We see that black gunkiness. Um, we can get licking of the paws. They smell like Doritos. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that can happen. Now, when we use beneficial yeast or even probiotics, one of the principles of why those are very powerful in those situations is that we're starting to reestablish balance. So out competing the bad bacteria or the bad yeast, right? The candida. It doesn't mean that we go in and we like carpet bomb the whole thing. That's, you know, that's the terrain theory versus germ theory principle where we need to look at the whole ecosystem and what, how do we support a healthy ecosystem versus like killing off everything or all the bad things. Mm -hmm. But in reality, we end up taking everything out um, and we end up with worse health in the long term. That's conventional medicine. So that's really important to understand. But these beneficial yeasts, like the Saccharomyces boulardii, the nice thing is we have lots of research study behind how it works and how it manipulates the immune system, especially in the gut, and how it can help outcompete bad yeast too to recreate and rebalance a healthy ecosystem inside that gut. So I think that is a really good point. Now, sometimes different types of probiotics can make things worse. So that's important to understand too. Um, 
I mean, we could do a whole episode on probiotics, right? So it's one of those things that probiotics aren't the end all be all. They're not the cure for everything. They can be a tool in the toolbox, but they can also potentially create resistance to healing too, if they're not used properly, or if certain types of probiotics or brands are used that also have other things in them that are increasing inflammation. So I'm not a big fan of a lot of things like ProViable, which is one of the most common probiotics used when you go to the vet, because unless it's changed, I know it constantly fluctuates, but at this time, it also has the ingredient titanium dioxide, which is a known carcinogen. Why, mm. why would we want to add that in, right? I don't want to add that in. We have other options and choices that are powerful. Yes, the other probiotics that are in that supplement can be powerful and helpful and they can work and there's research behind them. But I'm also looking at the ingredient list because if we're using something, a food, a supplement or a treat, that's going to aggravate inflammation for a pet that's experiencing diarrhea, you know, we're just going to create resistance. So mm -hmm. for that pet getting over it faster. The other one I don't use is Fortiflora. And so the two most commonly I used to use them and recommend them before I learned a lot more. <laughs> and then I realized there's a lot of synthetic vitamins and minerals. There's also Animal Digest, and that's a rendered product. Um, so we have really poor quality meats and all sorts of waste products that go into the rendering industry. I don't want that in my pet, and I don't want to use that for patients that are especially experiencing GI upset. It can work. And I know people will say, well, it worked for my pet. I'm not saying it can't. But when we have better options out there, make sure you are reading those ingredient lists and you're looking and asking your veterinarian if you are getting that from the vet. What does this do? What does that mean? Um, and asking those questions and then looking them up yourself too and diving deeper into that also is really important because that's how I learned like, oh, I was using that. And yeah. It helped for some pets, but also too, it now makes sense why there were a lot of pets where it didn't help them long-term and it probably made things harder and potentially even worse internally. Yeah. Um, very true. And second question, are you quicker to get a puppy or a kitten to the vet when they have diarrhea? Oh, that's a great question. So yes. And small dogs also. So like your smaller dogs, like chihuahuas and like, we can't fast them for long periods of times. They can become hypoglycemic or have low blood sugar. So we, we definitely, for those animals, they can dehydrate more quickly. Um, I do recommend going to the vet. Um, and if you do go to the vet, they will probably recommend antibiotics, not always. There's things shifting in the vet world, which is good with like guidelines around this type of condition. But ask your veterinarian about, can we use other, are there other supplements or probiotics or other things that we can try first? And then let's do sub-Q fluids to help rehydrate them. So those are great questions to ask your vet, because especially for your puppies and kittens, we need to preserve and protect that microbiome. We don't want to be using antibiotics if we, if we can avoid it. That's really, really important because it can really take a knock to the microbiome that takes potentially weeks, months, even years to recover. And sometimes we can't recover it. Um, so we just need to be aware of that. So this is where being that proactive, amazing pet parent and just asking those questions with your vet and having a conversation. And a lot of times those vets will be able to find a way to work around that. Awesome information. Thank you for that. So inflamed and red ears. <laughs> so like, again, like you said, it's the middle of the night or it's the weekend and all of a sudden your dog is just like, ah. <laughs> yes. And it's awful and it's really painful. It's not fun yeah. for anyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So once again, we're talking about acute. So keep in mind for all of these conditions, especially if you're seeing recurring patterns, we need to ask why, why is it happening? really, really important. So even if we're using, I say a lot of times we're in, we end up using herbal medicine, like Western medicine, where we end up only treating symptoms, but we didn't actually fix the reason for why they're there, what I call the root cause. The symptoms, a check engine light. So keep that in mind as we're going through this, but this is going to help get you through that emergency um, and provide more comfort and support to your pets. 
Now, ears. Ears are one of those where I am, depends on where we're at with the ear infection, but I tend to have pet parents go to the vet more quickly with an ear infection um, because it is so painful. It can have numerous causes also in terms of like there could be a foreign body like a grass seed, especially during this time of year or summertime, or if you have a dog that's running through fields. So we need to make sure like they get stuck down there and they stay down there. Like we got to like so, pull them out. <laughs> so glad you said that because that is exactly where my mind went. Um, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to throw yeah. in this quick story. So I, that happened to my dog a few, maybe four or five years ago. I was still in San Diego and it just like overnight, like what happened? And I took her to the vet because it was like sudden onset and the technician came in and wanted to, to do a, a swab of the ear before the vet came in to check anything. Yeah. And I'm like, no, nah. like I literally was like arguing with this vet tech and she's like, but the vet, you know, she's going to want to know like what's in the, I'm like, yeah, but if there is a foreign object, if she has something stuck in her ear and you stick that Q-tip in her ear, I, I'm not okay with that Yeah, because you haven't looked in her ear. So like the vet finally came in after this vet tech coming in like three or four times trying to convince me to let her stick this Q-tip in my dog's ear. And I'm like, no. And then my <laughs> vet, who, like I was, you know, good enough, like close enough with that. I'm like, I was fuming at this point because this vet tech had just made me so angry. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Like, I love my vet techs, but like, I was just like, no. And, and so I told my vet and I'm like, look, you can, t you can look in her ear and tell me that I was completely out of line and whatever, but I, no, I'm not letting you do that. And they found a grass seed. No, okay. it wasn't anything like that, that but I'm like, I mean, here's the thing. That's, that's really important because you're a hundred percent right. Like think about these grass seeds can migrate. They, we, the way the ear canal is, is it's, it's not like ours. It goes mm -hmm. down across the eardrums here. So you can't see that. Like, and for like this, the second reason too, is your pet's not going to let you see it because yeah. it's painful. And yeah. so this is where making sure that the veterinarian is looking in the ear with an otoscope. And if they can't, this is where sometimes sedation is necessary. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not a fan, once again, if we unnecessary things, but if we can't get a good look, for one, we don't know if the eardrum is intact. So if we put ear meds, ear wash, anything in there, like, so when you're at home and there's, I give people recipes for like ear washes, you know, ear treatments, but it's really important to know if that eardrum is intact before we put things in there. Because that's going to go right into the middle ear, can go into the inner ear, and that can cause a whole lot of health issues. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is where, yes, we need to go to the vet <laughs> like, and so and have a physical exam. And if the grass seed thing, I see I've had clients come uh, when I was in more traditional practices, you know, they had been to the vet over and over and over again. And they're like, they're not fixing it. And they come, they switch clinics. They come and see us. We take a look. I'm like, well, there's a grass seed here. You remove it. You have to sedate them usually to remove it. And you give the ear a good flush. You make sure everything's okay. And the pet improves. So that's the thing. Like you can try all these things. But once again, that root causes the grass seed. So that's really, really important to keep in mind. So I wanted to say that. The other thing too is that a lot of times, and I see this online, is that people assume like, ear mites are every ear condition and it's not <laughs> like it's it's just not um you know if you have a new rescued cat yes it's highly it's much more highly likely that that brown gunk and especially they're scratchy they're it's really ear like they are loud they are chattery they are itchy like it's ear mites are gross um and but the only way to know is to actually look under the microscope and see them and the treatments are different so that's something to keep in mind too, is that a lot of times this is actually a second, this is the secondary bad yeast, <laughs> which is usually due to an allergy, a gut health issue, a food sensitivity or environmental allergy. But the vet will have or should be looking in the ear. If there's a lot of gunk there or waxy buildup, take a swab, 
look under the microscope and they can see, is there an overgrowth of bacteria? Is there an overgrowth of yeast? Is there a combination? Now, then they, what they do is they'll pick the ear meds. I'm not against ear meds. I think they're really powerful. They're really helpful at getting results much more quickly than some of the herbal products. And I'm saying like, these can work well too, but I do find that they can work much faster. And then we need to figure out, well, why did that happen? So I'm a big fan of getting your pet feeling much better, much more quickly. I'm not a fan of using steroids and oral antibiotics. That's important. And that's commonly used unless the ear is so inflamed that the ear canal is closed off. And then that's when we need to reduce that inflammation because ears, if we don't fix the ear, what happens over time is we get chronic inflammation that actually turns into scar tissue. And then the treatment for that is to actually remove the ear canal. It's called the Tika Lebo procedure. So this is very common in like cocker spaniels that get chronic ear infections and things like that. So this is why like I don't tend to mess around with ear infections because I just see it turn into something more, much more than it needed to be. Now, keeping in mind, we look at root cause of really, really important. Now, here's the thing. If you're like, great, Dr. Katie, I can't go to the vet or I need some other options. Keep in mind with the, you know, our disclaimer you know, there could be more going on. We always recommend going to the vet, but this is where some of the things that I do recommend having on hand is a gentle ear cleaner to flush out that ear. Keeping in mind, you still don't know if the ear canal, like if you're seeing a lot of redness, it's very sore. There's a lot of gunk coming out, especially if it smells like a stinky sock. That's usually a pseudomonas infection, which is a really serious bacterial infection. Um, and a lot of times that can rupture ear canals. So if you're seeing that, I would try your best to get into the vet if you can. But if it's like, okay, it's a little bit red, they're scratching, like there's some waxy buildup. Um, this is where using an ear cleaner and there's, there are a lot of great herbal brands out there. Um, there's, you know, I have a recipe for like green, like green tea with your apple cider vinegar, some putting some drops of calendula can also be very soothing too. Calendula helps with redness. It's an herbal, it's an herb that will help reduce that inflammation, calm things down. It helps soothe the skin and help regeneration of the skin. And then your apple cider vinegar is going to help break up the debris and cleanse that ear. Um, and green tea is really helpful for like histamine. So excess inflammation, especially if we have allergies or something like that, that's aggravating this and causing it. So creating your own concoctions, you can definitely do. There are other brands too that have a lot of herbal products also that you can use. There is also too coconut oil, right? Very powerful to put coconut oil on a gauze swab and just wipe around the ear. Um, I don't recommend putting a ton of stuff into the ear unless you've had it examined, but coconut oil has antibacterial, antifungal properties from the lauric acid that's part of it. Um, so that's going to help. It's soothing. Um, it's You're not going to do damage with that. Now, the other thing too, when you are cleaning or touching these ears is that if you, you can't like Q-tips, like putting a Q-tip down, I don't recommend it because once again, the ear canal goes down across the eardrums here. And if we're seeing that Q-tip disappear into that ear canal, we don't know if we're hitting the eardrum. So we don't want to rupture the eardrum, which would be really, really painful to the pet. Um, just think about yourself, right? I'm sure, yeah. Have you done that? I've done it where I'm like, oh, we're a little too close there. That was not, yeah. that didn't feel good. <laughs> now you can use it to clean like the little folds and all the things where you can mm -hmm. actually see it. That's completely fine. But if you wrap your finger, like a gauze around your finger, your finger can't get down there. So you can just kind of wipe around with your finger. Um, so that's how I would approach that. The other thing too, there is a product, um, that many pet parents can get online called Zymox and it has like a gentle, like a lower dose steroid that that's in that product. And that's going to help. Re yes, it's not a natural product. However, once again, the goal here is to reduce that inf inflammation really quickly, bring out, bring down the heat and 
help with all that inflammation. And that works really well. And a lot of times just getting that under control. Now we can use a cleaner, your pet's feeling much better. And then you can start diving into the journey if this is a recurring issue of like, okay, let's figure out why this is happening, right? Very, very important. Um, but there's definitely those types of things I'd be looking at. The other, uh, alongside your coconut oils, things like colloidal silver. Colloidal mm -hmm. silver can be really helpful too if we're concerned with like an infection. Um, and that can be added to like your ear cleaner and type of thing if it doesn't already have it in there. So those are a couple of things for inflamed red ears. How about um, excessive itching and or hot spots, which could sometimes be seen together <laughs> <laughs> with your ear infection right it's like the, the whole yeah. thing happens all at once and you're like what yeah. the heck right yeah. so your excessive itching so keeping in mind um if you're seeing like seasonal allergies or environmental allergies food sensitivities this is really common i see excessive itching with heavy metal issues or detox problems too so it's not always allergies so the goal here is how do we help this pet? Once again, the go-to usually for like conventional is Benadryl. My go-to that is nature's Benadryl is quercetin with bromelain. So quercetin is going to naturally reduce histamine. So when we get into like that, if you think about like a bee stings you or an insect bites you and your skin inflames, it gets all red. That's our immune system reacting the way that it should by having those cells, those mast cells come to that area and produce histamine. Um, and that's where we get that itching and red redness. And then it gets worse. You start itching and it just gets worse. Um, and so this is where using quercetin and having this on hand once again is very powerful and helpful. It is a human supplement product. So um, typically using, I would say it's like five to 10 milligrams per pound twice a day is usually the dosage. And it, all of these are very safe um, and can be used alongside if your pet's on other medications. Once again, ask your veterinarian, though, if your pet has other health problems or they're on a lot of medications. Ask them ahead of time. Remember, this is like things to have on hand in case of an emergency. So this is an important conversation to have with your vet prior to anything happening. So quercetin is definitely one of my go-tos that's going to work and help pretty quickly. What I like about it too, is that it, it does multiple things, which a lot of these herbs and supplements do multiple things in the body. So it's going to help heal the tight junctions in the gut lining also. So we're supporting the gut with quercetin. Bromelin helps increase the effectiveness of it. And bromelin is like the digestive enzyme part of pineapple. Um, so it's, it's also nice for multiple reasons, but it helps that bro or it helps the quercetin work better. Now, with excessive itchiness also, this is where nettles, so nettle tea can work really well also. Um, and for numerous reasons, it has a lot of like nutrients. It also helps with histamine. Um, so using that, brewing a cup of tea is pretty easy to do if you don't have like a nettle tincture on hand. Um, I also like using for topical, like we have hot spots. What are the things that we can use topically to help calm it down? So black tea is a, a once again an astringent it has those tannins in it and it's going to dry out inflamed skin so for paws that are red and inflamed using that betadine is also helpful for that betadine diluted betadine baths for the feet like a foot soak but if we have like a a red irritated oozy hot spot this is where using your teas like your green tea your black tea calendula tea um, are really, really helpful. Chamomile tea is also very soothing and helpful too. And all of those also can be used internally. If you're using things like green tea, just use your decaffeinated green tea um, for your pets, but topically they work fantastic. The other thing for hot spots when they're oozing that works amazing is green clay. I love green clay. Green clay is very, very helpful. I use it all the time for like lacerations and hot spots, anything that's oozing, putting some green clay on it, letting it sit. And a lot of times that will dry it right up. It has antibacterial properties too. It works really, really well. Um, so those would be some of my go-tos for supporting immediate 
and helping calm things down. And then of course, there's other things we could add in if we're like, this is occurring long term, but that can help kind of bring things back down to a level where we're not in an emergency state right now. Yeah, I had so my dog, she was just licking. I think this was maybe last summer, one of her paws, she was licking, licking, licking. And I'm like, what is going Mm. on? And there wasn't anything like apparent. She didn't have like like, a grass red or anything. But like she had definitely licked a spot that was like getting raw. I'm like, ah. And I took um, some French green clay that I got from Animalio and was just, I just kind of dusted it on top of it. And I mean, immediately she was like, yeah. And just sat back, like she just sat back and stopped licking it. And I'm like, yeah, I guess it's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. The green clay is incredible. Um, I always say, you know, Animalio is a great brand. You can use human brands too. Just make sure it's food grade. So, you know, if because yeah. our pets can groom it off. You can use it safely with cats too if you need to. Mm. So if they're over mm. grooming themselves and they're creating hot spots or sores, um, it can be harder if it's not like a moist, wet lesion. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't stick as well, but I definitely, right. it's it's really powerful. I didn't mention like when to go to the vet when that's happening. Obviously, if your dog or cat is like, scratching constantly and it's just not stopping you need to get them examined because there can be things like this could be a parasite or a mite issue um and there's certain diagnostics like skin scrapes that a veterinarian can do to identify what's happening um and fix it faster now there's herbal options and other things you can use if that's what's happening but a diagnosis is very helpful because that treatment, whether it's conventional or holistic, is very different versus an allergy. So we do want to know once again what's going on. Um, now, if you do go to the vet, because for itchiness, this is where most people are like, I will not go. Because Apoquel, your hydrolyzed mm-hmm. prescription diets, like this is where things like start really falling apart. Antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is where if you're in that situation and you you're not sure what's happening and there's like sores or they're creating hot spots. have your vet do skin scrapes or impression smears or, you know, where they can look under the microscope to see what those cells look like to rule out parasites to help identify or, you know, make sure that there's not something more going on and then get the plan. And then this is where I would say, okay, now we know that there's, you know, we've ruled out mites or that type of thing. If we're like, okay, we're being presented with cytopoint injections, Apoquel, all those things. Yes, sometimes like a short course can help bring things down if your pet is miserable. Once again, I'm Mm -hmm. not against conventional drugs. There is a time and place for quality of life. But if you're like, okay, they're not that bad. Now I know, like I have more information. I want to go home and then partner with like an integrative vet or, you know, use some of the tools you have in your toolbox. Great. But say to the vet, like, thank you. You know, I want to look into some other options. If it's not working, I will let you know, and then we can explore this way. So that way we're acknowledging what's going on there. This is the tools in their toolbox. That's why they're recommending it. This is what we're taught in vet school. This is what we're taught through just this is conventional care. And so Mm -hmm. keep that in mind. They're doing the best that they can. They want to help your pet. Um, But Give yourself an out if you're not comfortable with that plan Um, and then go and look deeper into, okay, what do I need to do to heal this underlying cause? Unless it was just like a bug, you know, like a bee sting or something like that, right? Or an insect bite, right? Like, okay, usually that's acute, but with a lot of times this excessive itching and hot spots, this is more of a chronic health issue um, that Mm -hmm. can go away and then reoccur. And we definitely need to be asking why and have the vet do some diagnostics to help you figure out and rule out the whys and then go down the journey of healing it with the, the more natural way, if you're inclined to do that. Yeah. That's so important to know that you can actually have that conversation with your veterinarian and say, thank you, but no, thank you in this moment. (laughs) It's hard. Um, It's not easy. Yeah. It can be really, really hard for people to do that. Um, Okay. So I've got two more if you have time. Yes, let's go. Let's go for it. All right. Uh, This one is interesting to me. And and, um, like, 
I kind of understand why we added it to the list, but um, I, I think most people would not put these together. So acid reflux. <laughs> I added it because it's like so common with the patients I like support. <laughs> and I think, you know, the thing is, is that I, I feel like a lot of pet parent, like it's happening more and people just don't know what it is. Right. Like you hear, mm -hmm. here's, here's what acid reef, like when we think about ourselves, right. Heartburn is what we're talking about the equivalent mm -hmm. in pets. And so they're bringing up acid into the esophagus, it's very uncomfortable, it creates a burning sensation and can create a lot of inflammation. Sometimes also too, acid reflux can be associated with what we call bilious vomiting, where if you're like more common in dogs where they go for a longer period of time, usually overnight, we don't feed them right away in the morning and then they like vomit up bile. So mm -hmm. that can also be associated with your acid reflux conditions. But more commonly what's happening is we see your pets more common in dogs with this symptom as they eat and then they get into what's called a prayer stance where they're you know extending down and they look like they're stretching but they're stretching because there's a burning sensation in this upper part of the GI tract so from the stomach up through the esophagus so they're stretching and they're uncomfortable and then you see this excessive lip licking and you might hear them burp a little bit and then they just sit there and they're licking, but they're not licking their paws. Sometimes they'll lick their paws and legs too as a self-soothing because of the acid reflux or they're licking the floor excessively. And you're like, why are they licking the floor so much? And they're like self-soothing because there's a possible pain. Now, some pets also have OCD. So I don't want everyone being like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like it's all, you know, there's multiple reasons for symptoms or thing or behaviors that we're seeing. So keep that in mind. But if your pet's constantly sitting there and licking their lips. So one of my cats, she'll do this occasionally, my senior cat, she'll be sitting behind me and I'm like, she's, she's doing it right now. And I can hear her doing the lip licking and she just like, mm -hmm. and then sometimes there'll be like a burp or a little bit of like, you know, and so what that tells us most of the time is that the reason usually is there's a problem with that upper GI tract. So we first need to look at what foods are we feeding. If we're feeding like a kibble diet, especially with cats, we need to adjust that and change that. But a lot of pets also, as they age, they lose the ability to produce digestive enzymes. The other thing too, is that there can be microbiome issues. The microbiome is not just the small intestine, large intestine. There's also a microbiome in the stomach. And what can happen is, is that we start having a stomach that doesn't have enough stomach acid in it. And that stomach acid is really important for digesting the food, but also activating the certain types of cells to release digestive enzymes, to break down proteins that then stimulate the pancreas to release more digestive enzymes into the small intestine to continue breaking down that food so it can be absorbed. So if we don't have enough stomach acid, and this sounds counterintuitive, right? You're like, well, wait, antacids work really well for this, right? This is why people stay on them, pets get put on them for months to years, which is not how they should be used. But what happens is, is that if we start giving antacids, yes, you're going to reduce stomach acid, but we're actually making the problem worse. And the reason why we're seeing the acid reflux symptoms is that what can happen is, is the food gets stuck with like gas and some acid. And if there's, if it's not emptying out of the stomach into the small intestine and it's sitting there for too long for numerous reasons, because it's not being broken down, um, you know, if we're feeding a more processed pet food, that can happen also. And we end up having like a burp or there's that gas, it brings it up to the stomach or it brings it up to the esophagus and there's acid with it. So it irritates it. So it doesn't mean that there's too low of stomach. There's not enough, you know, there, or there's too much stomach acid and we need to reduce it. It's actually the opposite. And that's when we run mm -hmm. into trouble with antacids, especially when we go on them long-term. So this is where it's really important that we're not just treating symptoms with antacids. I don't use antacids when this is happening. This is where we need to get the body readjusted again. So using supplements like digestive enzymes that specifically have things like betaine hydrochloride, which is going to bring more stomach acid in to help with the digestive process, to help stimulate those digestive enzymes and make the processing of food much easier. 
now we have to also calm down inflammation. So once again, like, yes, we have this imbalance. That's a lot of the time the issue. Um, we have to figure that out to heal it. But this is also where we can provide, once again, I love teas. They're so easy. I just love teas. But chamomile, peppermint, ginger to help with like nausea. Um, they're all very soothing and really help with managing this and managing the mm -hmm. symptoms. So they're very like peppermint's very cooling. Um, it helps. It's an anti-inflammatory also. And the other thing too, that I add to those teas. So this is literally what I'm talking about teas. Like you brew a cup of tea, you let it cool, remove the tea bag, and you're using the liquid, like what you would drink. Um, and you're not going to overdose your pet. That's the beautiful thing about it because it's more of a dilute um, infusion mm -hmm. versus tinctures or more concentrated forms of herbs. But adding in Manuka honey is very powerful also. Mm -hmm. It's very soothing. It also has antibacterial properties because a lot of these pets, I'm seeing it more and more now. Um, there's PCR tests that are getting done for these pets and it's showing overgrowth of Helicobacter. Helicobacter is commonly found in humans with acid reflux because we need more acid. And when we have an ecosystem that doesn't have enough acid, these bad bacteria, these pathogenic bacteria can overgrow. And so this is where using some herbs, peppermint also has some helico, um, it helps fight helicobacter also naturally, where we're not using very strong antibiotics to wipe them out, but we can use the power of these herbs and things like Manuka honey to help calm, soothe, but also help reestablish a healthy ecosystem in the stomach. So that's what I'd be looking for. I'd be thinking about those other things. I'd be testing the microbiome also um, to make sure that we don't have an overgrowth of E. coli, which is also really common in pets that have acid reflux symptoms. And then there's things like bacteriophages that you can use to help bring those levels back down to a healthy level. Um, and a lot of times doing that alone the acid reflux goes away. I think that might be the most eye-opening one for people because <laughs> it is just like, oh, antacids, antacids. Like, yeah, and it doesn't right? work. And then, I mean, yeah. I have patients come to me. So here's the thing. Once again, like if you're having severe acid reflux issues, um, I find that this one doesn't tend to be as much of an emergency most of the time. It's more of like this uncomfortableness. But if you don't yeah. know what's happening, then I could see where like potentially with severe cases, like if you're not sure, bring them into the vet. Um, mm -hmm. And if you've watched this episode, ask about acid reflux. Yeah. So, but this is That's also right. where in terms of like, if you need to use something to calm it, like it can work. And, but that's why also too, we end up like, and people get stuck on it or addicted to it. Right. And then what mm -hmm. happens, this is the problem. Pets, people stay on this long-term, it increases the risk of esophageal cancer in humans. Mm. There's no study on pets, but I'm like, I probably does the same in pets, I would imagine. Um, yeah. The other problem is, is that it impairs the absorption of things like calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and other really important vitamins and nutrients. So now what we're doing is we're creating more resistance to the body to heal or to achieve optimal health. And create more health issues down the road. So mm. it's a huge issue. The other problem, <laughs> there's multiple problems, is that yeah. it actually shuts down the parietal cells from producing their own acid again. Mm. So pets that stay on these drugs for like months to years, sometimes we can't regain function of those cells. And mm. this isn't a drug that should be stopped immediately. It needs to be weaned off over time. So if your pet's on yeah. that and you're freaking out right now, go slow. <laughs> Work with someone yeah. to get your pet off of that very slowly. But we also have to make sure that we're figuring out and healing why is the symptom there or else your pet's going to have rebound reflux. They're going to be worse. And two, it'll come back if we're not actually figuring out why is it actually there. So that's also once hopefully there's a theme here, right? Like yeah. we're we're talking about acute symptoms, but a lot of these turn into chronic health issues. And so we can use these remedies, but we also need to be asking why so that way we can keep it from coming back and actually heal the body. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh goodness. Yeah, that one that one's a little scary, but you know, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't. Can... We 
I, I see so many pet parents heal their pets with acid. I actually really enjoy, I don't like that they have acid reflux, obviously, but when I see that, I actually really enjoy working with pet parents that have this condition because Mm -hmm. it's just, it's not treated properly from conventional medicine. And so when we actually give the body what it needs and it, you know, there's an up and down journey, just like with any chronic health problem. Um, and each Mm -hmm. pet is different in an individual, but the response, it's amazing. Like it's, it's absolutely amazing. And it also changes the pet parent's life because usually they're not sleeping because they're listening to the mm-hmm. lip licking all night, or mm-hmm. they're having to feed them in the middle of the night, because they're going to have bilious vomiting in the morning. So it's, I just absolutely love watching like the transformation and like, people regaining their lives. And like, it's just amazing. Mm-hmm. Like I get goosebumps, because even though it seems really scary, like this one here, like, I think it's actually easier to heal this than sometimes these chronic allergy issues. Mm, interesting. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that you're out there changing <laughs> these, these pet lives. Um, okay. So last one, and I can hear my husband in the background with dinner. He's like, it's time, right? Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> vomiting. Vomiting. Hopefully he's not having vomiting or vomiting after dinner. <laughs> right? so, uh, so vomiting. So this is very similar to like you're using supplements with like diarrhea. So this is where Mm -hmm. we have a lot of inflammation, irritation. So same with acid Mm -hmm. reflux. So a lot of those remedies we can use for vomiting. This is where we can have some serious underlying problems like obstructions that can be creating vomiting. So if your pet is vomiting over and over again, they are lethargic. They aren't pooping out the back end. <laughs> like yeah. if they don't feel good, if they are a known like sock eater or they pick up things and they eat rocks or things and you know that about them, please go to the vet because vomiting is, it is a serious condition that can turn even more serious or deadly for animals. <laughs> so x-ray yeah. things like that, this is where it's important to, to rule those things out because you don't want to be giving a lot of things if they have an obstruction. And vomiting can be due to a lot of other underlying health conditions too. So if your pet's displaying any of those other uh, comorbidities, the lethargy, they don't want to eat, they're just, there's repeat vomiting, it's not improving or it's getting worse, please go to the vet or go to the ER. This is, this is probably, I would say your most serious condition we're talking about today for in terms of going to the vet. Um, more gotcha. serious than the red ears. <laughs> so yeah. we emphasize that one, but this one is definitely more serious than that. So um, now if you're noticing like they're having intermittent vomiting or like it's a one-time episode, this is where giving them slippery elm or marshmallow root is very soothing. Once again, it's going to help coat and soothe. If you're using capsules of slippery elm, open them up and put them in broth. So that way it's actually coating the esophagus and the stomach. Um, We don't want them to have to digest a capsule first to actually start working. So that um, is really helpful. The other thing too, I'm not trained in homeopathy, but I know enough about like some of the acute remedies that we can use. Um, So if you're seeing like a one-off vomiting or a couple bouts of vomiting, you know your pet's nauseous. This is where using like Nux Vomica 30C can be really powerful and helpful. Um, the other one too, I didn't mention for diarrhea, but it can be potentially used for diarrhea and vomiting is your arsenicum album is another homeopathic remedy. It's kind of like your food poisoning symptoms is how I think Mm -hmm. about when you would use that remedy. Um, but next vomica is a great one to have on hand if you're seeing some vomiting and try that. Um, but you won't want to be thinking about soothing things. Um, once again, you can use your teas that I mentioned. Um, for your acid reflux, very soothing and easy to use. You could always use the tea mixed with your slippery elm. Um, and that way you're getting the benefit of, of both of those. Um, but those are just a couple of things that are super easy to give to help calm down ginger. I did want to mention that ginger is really, really powerful and helpful. Um, there are human studies that show it's a stronger anti-nausea than anti-nausea medications for pregnant women. So that tells you that it works pretty well. So, um, Mm -hmm. so definitely using some of those to help calm things down is where I'd start. And good tip 
that that is that vomiting is probably one of the please get to your vet yeah things. especially i mean a one-off one one or two or three and it's like yeah okay they're still like bright and alert but yeah so for example one of one of my clients in our blueprint program the other day her her pup like her puppy kept vom- and he's not a young he's like a nine month old puppy. So, you know, I'm not concerned with parvo. There was no exposure, things like that. But mm-hmm. he had multiple rounds of vomiting and it was not improving. And she had said like he tends to eat socks and rocks. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh no. And he was lethargic. Yeah. He didn't want to eat. And so she ended up going to the vet, of course, made that recommendation. I said, you need to rule these out. I don't want you giving a lot of things, trying things. A lot of people they think give a laxative, right? They're not pooping do not give that kind of stuff. We need to make sure we rule out um, the obstruction first. He did not thankfully have an obstruction and he's okay now. Um, And so once we did the X or once we did the x-rays, then we were able to then start a lot of these remedies to support him and help him. You can use the teas. You can use a slippery elm to help before you rule it out. Um, But Mm -hmm. some of the other stronger things that I see people using, I wouldn't be using that until we make sure that we've ruled out an obstruction. Serenia, which is an anti-nausea medication, should not be given until you rule out an obstruction. Just FYI, a lot of people have it on hand, which is great. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great anti-nausea, but it is very strong and your pet will not vomit from an obstruction when Serenia is on board. If they Mm -hmm. vomit through Serenia, that's a really bad sign and you need to go to the vet. So keep that in mind. If you're concerned with an obstruction and you have serenia at hand, do not get mm-hmm. it. Wait until you've done an x-ray or you're less worried about an obstruction, like your pet's feeling fine, they're doing okay. So this is yeah. where I'd reach for like ginger instead, things like that to help calm and soothe. But that's just another that's another thing to be aware of. Well, Dr. Katie, thank you so much for all of these. This was so very informative and I hope can help a lot of pet parents. And I know this is the kind of content you put out all the time. So where can people find you in case they haven't already? Yeah. So more people can learn more at the natural pet doctor.com. <laughs> and then also to our Instagram and our Facebook page. So the natural pet doctor, and then of course on YouTube, we release new content every single week. So that's Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor. Yes. And I know you have, you, you mentioned your blueprint program and you have some master classes for people as well. So, and, and those are all available on your website. Um, please go check those out. It is absolutely worth your time. And thank you again for being here with us today, Dr. Katie. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And once again, thanks for all you do and sharing this and spreading it to all the amazing pet parents who took time out of their day today to listen and learn and help their pets a little bit more. And you as well. (laughs) Thanks.